Welcome in to the PFF NFL podcast coming to you from Chris Collinsworth's office. Yeah. Hey, Chris, we're in your office. Steve Pelizzola here with Sam Monson, my, my little brother. I am going to do all videos like this from now on in a giant comfy chair with a footrest, a footstool. I have my feet up. I'm basically lying back here whilst you're, you know, you're sitting in an office chair. You look comfy. You're good. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm, I'm, I like this. Full disclosure, we've had uh, some stuff going on in the studio the last few weeks where we've got these chairs where we're trying to get people the same height. Right. And now you and I are just going the complete opposite way. Well, yeah. So you, you mess up basically every shot you're in, right? I do not. Because you're, you know, you're out of proportion. No, get to my level. There are, there are regular size human beings and then there's you and there has been a push among certain people to try and equalize those heights. And that may be getting even more important as we have certain shorter hosts in the PFF That's a little ecosystem. Deceptive. I don't like that. So we're trying to, you know, jack other people up higher so that they look, yeah. they, they look at least the same species as you. But we were going to do this in this in this office, but Chris already had a comfy chair in here. I didn't want to roll in an office chair and I'm comfortable. So we just thought we'd lean into it. I'm, I'm going to lie back like this, chill, and you're going to sit there. And I, frankly, if people don't know that we're dramatically different sizes at this point, I don't know how to help. Well, that's my thing. We don't we don't need the TV tricks to realize, you know, for us. Right. Um, I will say, I don't know if Chris does this on purpose or not, but, you know, his chair is pretty high. Mm. And when you sit across from him at his desk, you're pretty low. He's really looking down on you. No, it's a comfy chair, but it's, it's you think, pretty low. You're saying it's like the uh, the Colin Cowherd thing where you, you set yourself up on a pedestal, like a throne overlooking everybody else yeah and then everybody that comes on your show is like you know your subject coming down and well when you're the basement star level like appealing. chris is a star you know colin's a star yeah. you know, maybe someday you'll have the really high chair i'll have a big throne yeah okay it could be all right, all right so this is our nfc east division preview we'll go division by division and we'll just uh get after it four teams at a time yeah sound good yeah let's go all right so let's start it's uh august 1st as we record here, mm -hmm. some things might change before the season. Probably not the date, though. Not the date. No, mm -hmm. today's August 1st. We get the Hall of Fame game tonight. Yeah. No banter about that. No no okay. Hall of Fame banter. We don't need to. We'll talk about it later. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll cover it in long form next week. The Hall of Fame game. Maybe not. All right. NFC East. Let's start with the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Alphabetically? Yes. Is that how we'll do it? Alphabetically. Okay. Dallas Cowboys. The big stories, of course, in Dallas trying to figure out contracts. How are they going to pay... Dak, Zeke, Amari Cooper, Byron Jones, Jalen Smith. How are they going to, you know, essentially build this team for the for for the future? I mean, we could touch on that briefly. Do you have a feel for what you think they're going to do? Throw Lyle Collins in there. He needs to get signed potentially. Um, I so yeah, I think ultimately they're going to cave and pay Zeke. Um. I think it would take an amazing amount of restraint and, you know, foresight and guts to a certain degree to lean with what all of the data says and say it's not worth paying Zeke. I think ultimately they're going to take the easier way out, which is, you know, he's an elite running back. We invested the fourth overall pick in him. Let's just pay him all the money because that's what we should do. And so ultimately, I think they're going to pay Zeke and Dak. And I think they're going to have to with Amari Cooper. You know, if, if they're using the same reasoning on yeah. Zeke that, hey, we spent a fourth overall pick on him, a first mm -hmm. rounder, then they're probably using the same reasoning on Amari Cooper, right? We yep. spent a first round pick, not just for a year and a half of services from him. It has to be for more. Mm -hmm. So I think they do want to keep the trio together. That could mean Byron Jones ends up becoming the odd man out, even if he might be the most valuable player out of that. Yeah, Not the most least. valuable, but uh, the one that you would... You know, relative to, to his position, you might yeah. want to grab the most. Um, the DAC one, we went into it long form before, so I don't want to get into it too much. But essentially, don't think he's worth $30 million, But if you could figure out something in the 20s that maybe has an easy out, you know. And th this is this ideal scenario. Teams don't necessarily operate like this. When they lock up a quarterback, that's their guy and all that stuff. I think the ideal scenario, though, is you keep him in the 20s. You keep looking for that next guy. Because as soon as he signs a new contract, he goes from one of the most valuable players in the NFL relative to his contract to one of the worst. Yeah. In an ideal world, you want to sign Dak to some kind of Andy Dalton style contract where he's kind of getting starter money, but you're basically 
on a year to year rolling gig where you're always looking for the replacement now. Right. Um, I think Amari Cooper and Byron Jones are the two players from that list that you need to target the most. I think as good as Zeke is, he's the guy that you should let walk because running backs, you know, whatever about how, uh, how replaceable they are and how um, valuable and how important, blah, blah, blah. Whenever they hit their second contract, whenever they're getting big money, they're just not worth it anymore. Right. Whatever you think about how replaceable they are, once the guy is looking for $10, $15 million a season, it just isn't worth it. So particularly when you have your number one corner, your number one wide receiver, your quarterback, and your, you know, one of your best linebackers all coming up for contracts, like the idea that you can afford to invest that money in a running back instead, I just can't get on board with that. All right, let's discuss Dallas's roster right now. Because when you go top to bottom, it's a pretty good roster it that is. we're looking at right now. Last year, the defense, you know, showed signs of life. It's very much, uh, you know, built through the draft, built uh, built from within, which uh, which I always love. Which always does put you in a point when those guys become good, figuring out who to pay and who to let walk. But let's start on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Travis Frederick coming back mm-hmm. um, from his uh, illness last year gives them, once again, Tyron Smith at left tackle, Travis Frederick at center, Zach Martin at right guard, all guys competing to be, you know, in the conversation at least at, at you know, number one at their respective positions. Lyle Collins, okay at right tackle. Connor Williams at left guard uh, needs to improve upon his rookie season after uh, really struggling last year. But again, the number two offensive line by our numbers. Amari Cooper on the outside at wide receiver. The big question is, okay, can they get something from Randall Cobb in the slot, replacing Cole Beasley? Will Michael Gallup take another step in year two? He showed, you know, signs of life last year. And, you know, we thought was a really good value as a third round pick. Kind of fascinated so, by Cedric Wilson as well. I think Cedric Wilson. things now that he's healthy. We liked him, again, as more of a second or third round prospect last year. He went in the sixth round. And then Jason Witten coming out of retirement to, you know, catch six to eight yard passes. They have Devin Smith. That's the Devin Smith, Ohio State, former top pick with a busted knee. Looks like it. Yeah, I would love to see if he could ever do anything. Yeah, yeah that's him. So fascinating. I'm not expecting. I didn't know he was him. there. Yeah. I mean, the injuries have really hurt his career. It is an interesting thing about speed receivers is, you know, what, you know, Tyree Kill looks like he's at a, playing at a different speed on the field. Deshaun Jackson has been a legit deep threat for 10 years in the NFL. Mm-hmm. What separates certain guys who run 4-3 from other guys who run 4-3? And, I, you know, there's physicality and there's just feel for the game and all these different things. And those guys that are deep threats don't just run by everybody. But it is, uh, it's not always easy to find that next, you know, true deep threat. Devin Smith looked like he had that potential coming out of Ohio State. God, I really liked him coming out. I was so bummed where he got busted. Noah Brown. Like back-to-back injuries, I think. So, so it's not the best receiving core in the NFL, but we've said for a while with Dak, needs guys that can separate. His best uh, year throwing the football was his rookie season. It was his highest graded year, his most accurate season. That was the year that he probably had the most open throws. Dez was still on the team. Witten was still useful, even though they didn't have the best chemistry. Cole Beasley was really good that year. So if Cooper, Gallup, and maybe a rejuvenated Randall Cobb can get open for Dak, you know, that's what they need. They need just uh, some easier throws from him. Yeah, I mean, I think him. I think the offense looks like it has real potential. Obviously, this is assuming Zeke ends a holdout and ends up being there. Um, but that offensive line should be back to being as you know one of the best units in the league. And as much as the difference between a terrible line and an average line is bigger than the difference between an average line and an elite line, having an elite line does definitely make a positive impact. It helps everything, particularly yeah. when your quarterback isn't. Patrick Mahomes, you know, when your quarterback isn't the guy that's going to be crazy regardless of what's in front of him when he needs a little bit of help like those mid-tier quarterbacks. Um, And, yeah, I think Amari Cooper made a huge difference. Randall Cobb is the question mark to sort of see what he has left. But I think Gallup and Wilson and and that group of receivers can form a really nice core around Amari Cooper. That offense on paper looks really good. And the the thing I always said about Travis Frederick at center – when they run that outside zone scheme, the really you know the wide zone, the center has a really challenging block, and nobody quite executes it like Travis Frederick in the NFL. When he executes the reach block on the nose tackle, you essentially we always talk about box count and everything. You essentially win a, an extra gap. So forget the box count for a minute. If Frederick makes that block, the running back cuts off of it, and Zeke's good at you know he has good vision in that scheme. Uh, you know, that gives you a free four to five yards and a free run into the secondary. That's that's where the value of Travis Frederick 
comes in versus what they got from a production standpoint last year. He's just special in uh, their zone blocking scheme. The best two guys in the NFL at doing that are both in this division with uh, Kelsey being the other Him one. and Kelsey. Yeah, slightly different style players, but yeah, absolutely fantastic at that. And then, yeah, defensively, you know, prior to last season, I wrote about that back seven with, you know, Byron Jones, not even knowing that Byron Jones would emerge the way he did in the right. move to corner. But I really liked even just the way they ch- stacked up on other corners in recent years between Cheetah Bay Awuzie, Anthony Brown, Jordan Lewis. I think among that group, it's a pretty solid cornerback group. And then we saw Leighton Van Der Esch and Jalen Smith emerge as the best linebacker tandem in the entire NFL. So, I mean, it's a modern day back seven right. of Sean speed Lee is still and there. versatility. Sean Lee is still there and we basically don't even talk about it. We anymore. don't. You know, he's he's technically still there and uh, banged up quite a bit. And he was a special player when he was on the field and healthy too. Um, from a roster construction standpoint, they've got Demarcus Lawrence off the edge. They probably have the worst interior defensive line in the NFL, if not, you know, one of the worst when it, with Malik. But in today's NFL, it's not the worst thing to be weak there and weak against the run there. Yeah, and I think they've made some moves to make this D-line more than just Demarcus Lawrence and others. Um, Randy Gregory being perennially suspended is a problem. But yes. you bring in Robert Quinn, who is a far better defensive end than he was, you know, an outside linebacker. He's one of those players that does kind of require his hand in the ground, that coil, that spring, the get-off you get when you, you're able to line up like that. He's, he's still a reasonable player that can add some pressure. You know, we'll bring 50-plus pressures a season for the Cowboys alongside Lawrence. That will help. They added, you know, a few interior players, whether it's draft, whether it's free agency. Um, Tristan Hill. You love Tristan Hill. I did. I, so I really like his potential. He's a guy that immediately jumped off tape when watching um, college games or grading college games way back. Like, I think it was his freshman season I was doing those games. Um you and should have wrote, written his name on the hard copy. I think I wrote it somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I remembered him. So. Google Doc. Throw it in the Google Doc. Yeah. So he was a guy that had crazy potential and just never seemed to fully live up to it. Uh, but there were question marks about how he was used or whether he, you know, there were problems between him and the coaching staff there. I was kind of surprised that he went as high as the second round, but it sort of suggests that, you know, an NFL team thinks that that is all true as well, that this guy has crazy potential, that the problems were a chemistry thing between him and the the coaching staff there, that in a new place, he's got way more potential. You bring in guys like Christian Covington. I think the potential for them to be much stronger in the middle is there. And as you say, even if they're not, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, the one, the other one thing to look at with the Dallas Cowboys, um, I was just tweeting this week. We've talked about it a little bit. We, I think the biggest mistake uh, or, or, thing, or the, the biggest thing I think that executives and team builders need to improve upon is properly assessing what their team was and what it is. So last year, the Cowboys won 10 games. Uh, Eric Eager from the R&D department is always reminding us, well, here's what the team actually should have been. Here's how, the, here's how well they played. And, you know, the old simplest way to do that, it was just um, point differential. You know, if you're, if you're, point differential is really high, you're probably going to win more games. And if for some reason you don't, in theory, you got unlucky. So Dallas was almost zero point differential. I think they were minus six or plus. I mean, they were pretty close to zero. So from a point differential standpoint, from a grading standpoint, they were a mid-tier type of team. So it is a little dangerous to going into this saying, well, they won X number of games and they improved this, this, and this. Therefore, they're going to get better. It's going to be a challenge for Dallas. It is a good roster, like we said. But the NFC is really tough. Again, the NFC East in particular is a lot of tough games with the, uh, well, maybe not the NFC East in particular anymore. But, you know, the Eagles, you still have to deal with twice a year. But the NFC in general is tough to come out of. So um, looking at them more as a mid-tier team last year with a mid-tier quarterback. So they're going to need some things to to go their way. They're going to need that defense to continue to progress. So how do you see them shaping up this year in terms of, you know, overall I don't want to say wins and losses because, you know, that could go anywhere. But but just as a descriptor, I think they're a 9-7-ish and seven ish type right. team. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just so a we're talking to... borderline playoff team. Yeah, I think they're borderline playoff team. And, you know, we, maybe we give every team's best case scenario. Best case scenario is Dak throws the ball the way he did a rookie. In, as a rookie. And uh, I, I just did a video on him. There'll be some videos on the YouTube channel breaking down all these NFC East quarterbacks really shortly. Dak's uncatchable pass percentage went up about three percentage points over the last two years. It's pretty significant. And he was throwing the ball shorter last year in particular. So if he just hits a few more throws and is a little bit more consistent, even last year, there were times 
Remember the Saints game? They won, what, 13 to 10? He had some open throws that he just missed that would have, you know, sealed the deal much earlier um, that he completely missed. If he just hits a few more throws, that, that offense is a lot more efficient. And, of course, a lot of that's dependent on, again, Gallup's development and what they get maybe from Randall Cobb and some others. So you in the same boat there? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I like this roster. I think it's in good shape. I would say I might, you know, I might say they are a wild card team as opposed to borderline playoff team, but we're in the same kind of ballpark. And yeah. I agree. Like the best case scenario is exactly what you've outlined. Dak goes back to being the best Dak we've seen and everything else around him is in really good shape and then they become one of the contenders. Yeah, and when you're talking about a wild card team in the NFC, you're talking about teams right, competing team. with the Packers and Seahawks, maybe the Bears. I mean, you're talking about a lot of teams in that mix. So, all right, let's get to the next team in the NFC East, the New York Giants. Is that next alphabetically? Yes, it is. The New York Giants. We spoke a little bit about them on Monday's podcast because they're completely depleted mm-hmm. at the wide receiver position, though we do expect Sterling Shepard to come back, Golden Tate to be back after his four-game suspension. Uh, at a macro level, I think we're looking at a team that's rebuilding. They just drafted Daniel Jones at number six overall. We talked quite a bit about that as well. Do what's best for Daniel Jones, yeah. right? So. What are your What are your thoughts? What What's the best? Let's start with best case scenario. What's the best case scenario for a New York Giants fan heading into this year? The best case scenario is this team is atrocious and they get the highest draft pick possible next year. It's atrocious with signs of life from Daniel Jones, or are you just going to write him off and say, you know what, go get the next QB? Yeah, so it's atrocious, bad enough that it makes them say that Eli is officially done. Daniel Jones comes in at midseason, plays eight games. Not well enough to win anything, but well enough to be to convince you that he is capable of being the future with an improved cast around there you him. Go. So the best case scenario for the New York Giants is they go three and thirteen. That gets them the number two overall pick in the draft. Eli plays so bad that you have to move on from him. Daniel Jones comes in, plays eight games in which he wins one, but shows enough moxie to prove that he's the guy. With, once you find you know a receiver from somewhere and they draft a guard no that would be that bad. number two that would be bad yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> so there's your best case for my, my buddy eggs friend of the show pff elite subscriber he, he needs a little you know he needs signs of life out of his giants so he yeah. needs to hear some some positivity um i think there is potential improvement on the offensive line they could be that creep back to average that we always talk about yeah. this year right Mike Remmers has average years in his career, and so does Nate Solder. Will Hernandez taking a step forward at, in his second year, adding Kevin Zeitler. So they've got some potential improvement there. Um, let's discuss Saquon Barkley as a player. Okay. You enjoy him as a player? Oh, he's spectacular. I mean, don't let the analytics guys ruin stuff for it. Don't let ruin them ruin running it. backs. Don't let, yeah. We can still enjoy good running back play. He is a spectacular. I mean, we. where do we put him? Number two in our list of running backs heading into this season in terms of just yeah, best Kamara. players. Kamara right behind him. Kamara. Yeah. And honestly, if you wanted to make the argument that he's better than Kamara, I wouldn't hate it. I mean, he has a much higher workload than Kamara in terms of every down running back kind of stuff. Look, he is he's the spectacular player we thought he was in college. And honestly, he's he may be better than he looked in college because the stuff that was bad, the negatives, the you know, the cons of Saquon Barkley weren't as apparent as a rookie as we thought they might be. Well, here's my concern on that, right? I said coming out, you know, if you look at Todd Gurley's career, I, I said you could see something similar. Right. Todd Gurley's rookie season, you're like, hey, he's showing some big playability. He was very much driven by big plays. Was Barkley too driven by big plays? Was it five five carries over 50 yards, mm-hmm. had a long of 78? So he averaged five yards per carry, but he's still on a you yeah. know run-for-run run efficiency standpoint. If you can't bank on those five, if that cuts down to two, which is pretty reasonable, and he's averaging 4.3 per carry, yeah. 4.2, are we saying he's special anymore? Or is it like the Barry Sanders? Not he's, he's, even if he's not Barry Sanders. Is it the Barry Sanders type thing where it's like you always have that big play potential and you know there's something to that? Yeah, and don't forget we also said that he might be more susceptible to how the offensive line performs because of that tendency sure. to bounce away from you know a cluttered hole and, and and try and bounce it outside try and make the big play and the offensive line wasn't great last year so if that line does take a step forward like we're saying maybe he does maybe the big play stuff does fluctuate and it goes down to two big plays instead of five but his down to down efficiency goes up because the offensive line is opening 
bigger holes from which he is less prone to bounce outside. And, and so his, improve, his production increases that way. I mean, I think ultimately you're talking about one of the most talented, just pure runners in the NFL, one of the most difficult players to defend, a guy who is a really valuable part of the passing game. He's a really right. dangerous receiver. Um, and, you know, ultimately everything we thought he would be. It's just that uh, he's the only thing basically to have any kind of optimism about on offense. Yeah. And the struggle with this whole running backs don't matter deal, yeah. even if he averaged 5.5 per carry and took huge steps forward, it's probably still, not going to matter. They still yeah. could only win four games. Uh, the roster is not on paper. It's not really constructed to win this year. Just to touch on Eli briefly. I mean, he, again, he's graded in the 20, uh, in the, in the 20s from a ranking standpoint mm -hmm. uh, each of the past five years. So we haven't seen good Eli Manning since 2011 or 12, despite a little fluctuation statistically. Yeah. I mean, you say the roster is not really constructed to win, you know, now. I mean, is it even constructed to win at any point? No. Right. That's the bigger problem. Okay. Well, I mean, like if they had Kyler Murray instead of Daniel Jones. Well, yeah. You'd feel better. Yeah. So if they had a good a really good quarterback that we felt good about. Yeah. Then yes. They, they don't. But they don't. No. no. So the defense, the defense is interesting because we're a couple of years away from it looking really good. No, so that, I, I, I want to touch on the defense in a second. Just yeah. to wrap up, Eli, real quick though. Okay. A couple numbers that stand out to me. Last year, the fact that he had, so from a turnover worthy play standpoint, he's ranked in the 20s, 26th uh -huh. in 2016, up to 14th in 2017, and then 27th last year. However, that's while playing as one of the more conservative quarterbacks with the third highest percentage of checkdowns in the NFL. If you have a high checkdown guy, you're usually talking about the guys on this list. Jacoby Brissett takes care of the ball pretty well. Alex Smith takes care of the ball pretty well. Tyrod Taylor takes care of the ball. Derek Carr takes care of the ball. Dak Prescott. These guys that are on this list, other than Blake Bortles and Deshaun Kaiser, take care of the football. Mm -hmm. Eli doesn't take care of the ball, and he's not being aggressive. If you're Eli... Like, just let it fly, man. Like, oh, he, yeah. he's got, he doesn't have his, a terrible arm at this point. He has enough arm to still get it down there. It floats at times, but like, just he, let it fly this year, Eli. Eli is not capable of turning himself into a late career Alex Smith. Yeah, I don't like, think Like, so. that's not his kind of play. His only hope to rescue any form of like Indian summer to his career is to just go Ryan Fitzpatrick, YOLO. Yes. and hope that you put together enough of a run where the, the great plays outweigh the mistakes for long enough that people are convinced that you've still got it. Embrace the volatility. Right. Eli. Just go, look, <laughs> I'm going to roll the dice every single time and I'm going to get a run of sixes <laughs> and then people will think I'm a genius. So that's, that's my thought on Eli. Daniel Jones, again, just briefly, we saw him as more of a second or third round type of prospect. You know, I think we'll know early on. I think with, with QBs, you know, early on, we knew early that Dak was better than a fourth round pick mm -hmm. from his first preseason game. I think Russell we'll know early Wilson. on. Yeah, with Wilson, right? You, yeah. This whole like you got to wait three years. Like sometimes you have to wait a little bit. But I think with Daniel Jones, if we were completely wrong, we might know immediately in the preseason if he looks really comfortable. So um, defensively, the thing I want to say here, this is another good test case in our whole, you know, if you're going to build a team, do you do it from the back to the front? Do you do it with a better coverage unit? Because the Giants may have the worst. Did we rank them as the worst pass rush in the NFL? We may have ranked them dead last. Uh, did we? They're down there. They have one of the worst pass rushes they do. The pass in the rush NFL. Terrible. However, I do like the investment that they've made in the secondary over the last couple of years. So much like the Baltimore Ravens, who did that at a pretty extreme level, that they have that discrepancy at an extreme level. The Giants could be moved in that direction. That'll be a good test case for us to see what they do defensively. Well, yeah, so... The interesting thing is they've the veteran players they brought in are all in the wrong positions. And then the players where they've actually targeted the right positions are all young. So the entire defense is basically down to how those guys pan out yeah. and what their strike rate was like in targeting all those young guys. So you've got, you know, Sam Beal, a what a supplementary draft pick last year. Third um, round, yeah. Right. You've got Julian Love, you've got DeAndre Baker, you've got a lot of young cornerbacks that you know had talent they were all sort of top multiple top few round picks in the in the draft but what is your strike rate going to be with those guys and how long is it going to take them to get it because rookie cornerbacks in particular is not usually a position where they come in and hit the ground running right away so 
yeah, it, it, it certainly isn't built to win now because of that. And whether it's built to win at any point is going to be entirely dependent on how good they were at scouting those guys. Yeah. We certainly like the volume, though. Bringing yes. in volume, right? Julian Love, maybe he ends up becoming a safety. I love the idea of corner to safety transitions and getting some playmakers out there. Uh, now, so that's the that's the back, that's the secondary, not necessarily a whole back seven, but the linebacking unit, still one terrible. of the worst in the NFL, if Dude. not the worst, and the pass rusher is one of the worst. I like Ogletree is still starting for them. I mean, well, he had all those interceptions that one game. Oh, God. I, I, I mean, if you can't see that Alec Ogletree is not capable of starting, you know, I, I, you, there's no help for you. I mean, I can see it. Right. There's hope you, for me. There's hope for you. You could be a defensive coordinator. Maybe even a personnel guy in the NFL. Yeah. But if you can't, personal if news. you can't see that Alec Ogletree has no business starting in today's NFL, I can't save you. I can I see can, it. However, I can bring the horse to water, but I can't make <laughs> him drink. However, around Alec Ogletree is BJ Goodson, who's shown signs of life in the run game at times. Nathan Stupar. I mean, Ryan Conley, fifth round pick last year. It's not like right. they're overflowing in other options. Yes. So the linebackers are weak. And if we are talking about pass rushers, Marcus Golden has shown, you know, some pretty good stuff in Arizona at points in his career. He's battled injuries. Right. O'Shane Zimenez, the third rounder in 2019, undersized but really productive in college. And then Lorenzo Carter, the opposite, the 2018 third round pick, was not productive in college but has, you know, the size and the look and the athleticism. Just, you know, if Carter or Zimenez can, you know, show signs of life there, maybe that moves them in the right direction as far as pass rush goes. And then, you know, up front, Dexter Lawrence pairing with Dalvin Tomlinson. They should be solid against the run there. Lawrence has a little bit more than just a 340-pound run-stopping ability. But, yeah, he was their second of three first-round picks. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated to see what this front is going to look like because, yeah, I think there is some sort of potential for pass rush on the edge. Uh, but, of like, the, the linemen... It's a lot of big bodies. There's a lot of big bodies up front. BJ Hill, Dexter Lawrence, Dalvin Tomlinson. And a lot of, in theory, run-stuffing specialists, which again is interesting in today's NFL. Uh, but they're not the only team that's doing that right now. It's almost like it's almost like teams are trying to be the one that gets ahead of the curve in zigging when everyone else is zagging. I have, I have a question for you. Yeah? So Kelly sends me a text message, okay. my wife. She said that she called me 10 times. And I literally didn't have one call. So mm-hmm. then I called her twice and didn't get through. And the president's in town he is. today. So she tell, she's like, maybe they got calls blocked. Is All that right. a thing? Does that happen? Ethan? Possibly. Yeah. Why would I ask Ethan? He's like 12. He's shaking your head like you're an He's idiot. 12 and he's from England and he has no idea. He is looking at you like you're a moron though. Maybe the, she said the calls are blocked. Nobody can, because the president's in town, so nobody can make phone calls. I mean, it's possible. It would seem extreme. That anywhere he goes, the phones within a you know X yeah. block radius just stop working. I could see that happening. That would seem like a problem. What are you talking about zigging and zagging? Yeah, it's so you've got the Giants, you've got the Lions, you've got a bunch of teams that appear to be building these giant, big-bodied run defense-heavy systems. It's almost like everybody is trying to get to be the team that gets one year ahead of the curve and is zigging when everyone else is zagging. You know, it's like if I get this right, if I'm there a year ahead of everyone else, we look like geniuses. Yeah, that's not. It's the almost place. like everyone's trying to do that, just assuming it's going to happen. That's not the place to zig and zag. Um, the Giants, overall, what are you expecting from the season? Oh, not good. How many games did they win last year? Four, Six. five. I don't know. I don't remember offhand. You should probably know these things. Listen, uh, I'm into I'm advanced say, analytics, not these basic ones like wins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say the best they do is They're, like six wins. I think it's a top ten. And I honestly don't pick think again. they even get to six. I think it's a top 10 pick again for the New York Giants. All right, let's move on to the Philadelphia Eagles. So we're putting our position rankings out there. We are. This summer. The we Eagles, do these the completely. Eagles appear to be top of everything. I was going to set that up. Okay, well done. I was going to do that in a more dramatic fashion yeah? than you did. Okay. Well, pretend I didn't do it. Just All keep right. going. What I was going to say is we do this completely independent mm-hmm. of every. You know, we're like, hey, let's rank the receiving cores. Let's rank the O-lines. Let's do it all separately. And we had no idea... Until we were like, wait, the Eagles are number one pass rush, offensive line, and receivers, receiving core in our rankings, right? Is it those three? Mm-hmm. And I would say Carson Wentz is a borderline top 10 quarterback. Eagles fans will be angry with that one. But I think he's currently 
you know, in that 10, 11, 12 area. Eagles fans have a weird dynamic in that they get more mad at us for saying they're good than saying they're bad. They were so angry to their Super Bowl year when we said they had the number one offensive line. They're as angry this year saying their receiving core is the best in the league. Yeah, they don't want that. They, they don't want that. They don't want the best offensive line. They don't want a top. Like, why every other fan base is mad if you say they suck. The Eagles fans are mad if you say they're good. But they want you to talk positively about Wentz. So you got to know when to talk positively and when not to. So when we're doing the receiving cores, the thing I was trying to figure out was, okay, how much do we weigh that elite top receiver? So DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, OBJ, whoever it is, versus the depth. And I think I was really focused on depth quite a bit in these rankings. And I look at that Eagles team, and I've said this a few times, but every style receiver, yeah, and they're six deep in pass catching options before you even get to the new running backs that they've added. So big Alshon Jeffrey on the outside, Deshaun Jackson, speed threat, Nelson Aguilar in the slot, and then two mismatched tight ends, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard. That's tough to contend with. Plus, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, who we thought was a first-round wide receiver. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I was watching him a little bit again the other day, looking at K.J. Costello. I don't care about his shiftiness. Gets off the line of scrimmage and as good of a contested catch guy as as we've seen come into the NFL. He also, I mean, he's not unshifty. Like he, his route running is fine. It's yeah, good. he's a good route runner. He um, knows how to maneuver the same, you know, Calvin Ridley light, but he knows how to maneuver right. DBs a little bit. The, so I could, I give some credence to the idea that a truly special number one papers over a lot of other cracks. Sure. Right? But it's not like the Eagles, it's not like their receiving core is a bunch of like number fours. Like they have good receivers. Yeah, I mean, they, all, they might have of one. Right. They don't have a Julio or a DeAndre Hopkins. They don't have somebody at that caliber, but it's not like they're a million miles off it. They're, right. They, they have good receivers. They have a balanced receiving core, and they have by far the most depth of any other team out there. And, and you're going to get into the red zone and say, okay, how am I going to cover Alshon Jeffrey? All right, Deshaun Jackson's taken off the field. How am I going to cover Arcega Whiteside? And then Ertz and Goddard. How are you going to cover those guys? And Aguilar. They've done plenty of tricks. And Aguilar. They run shifty stuff from the slot. They can, it's it's that balance again, right? They don't just get to the red zone. It's like, right, now it's jump ball time to the big guys. They can score in multiple different ways down in the red zone. And that's before you get to the idea that the offense is exceptionally good at scheming that stuff as well. Right. Doug Peterson and the, the right. play calling there has been among the best so, in the NFL the last couple of I'm years. I'm kind of amazed that people are that shocked that the we ranked the Eagles number one. It's I don't I don't see the argument against it. Like the only argument against it is they don't have a Julio. Which are you is arguing fine. against one guy again though? No. There's a load of people. Like two or three. No. Even Renner had them at like six. Yeah, we, we, did, we did argue internally a little bit about it. Yeah, so I, I just I, think it's it's extremely well-rounded. Yeah. Um, so some Carson Wentz numbers. You know, again, the last we saw him, well, last, last year he played pretty well. It wasn't a far cry from 2017, but I just did the YouTube video to show, okay, where was he definitely better in 2017? There were some things he did in that MVP caliber season that were just – destined to regress and they did last year third down we already talked about quite a bit uh tight window throw percentage his tight window throw percentage this is okay tight windows are you putting it on your receiver that this is one of the most unsustainable things in the nfl he went from 32nd as a rookie to first in 2017 to 16th last year so from last to first to exactly middle of the pack. <laughs> so that's about right. I mean, that's, so that's, that's one of those things where you're watching him in his MVP season. You're like, wow, throw after wow, throw after wow, throw. But the analytic, the analytical side in us should be saying great job, Carson Wentz. However, that's going to be tough to sustain. And that's what we saw last year. Same with his big time throw percentage. He was number one in 2017 at 6.4%. Last year, he dropped to 14th. That's like a normal year to year type of drop for Carson Wentz so again I think he's the type of guy that because of his arm and playmaking ability can put up some big numbers takes care of the ball pretty well for a guy with that skill set I would say uh, but you can, I don't think he's in that category where you just lock him in and he's going to put up a top 10 year every single year I, I don't think he's at that point yet yeah agreed um, but the he has maybe the best situation of anybody around right as it, we said the they have the best receiving core in the game and the best offensive line in the game. And in the past, that often that was that came with a little bit of a caveat, right? It's that 
with five healthy starters, the Eagles have the best offensive line in the NFL. But Jason Peters is like 127 years old. He's kind of breaking down. He'll miss some games. And then you have problems because then the big V has to play at left tackle. And that's an issue. Not so anymore because they spend their first round draft pick on Andre Dillard, who was the best pass blocking tackle prospect yeah. in this draft. So now, okay, Jason Peters, probably the same deal. He's probably going to miss some games at this point. I would say that's Maybe a safer bet than suggesting he's going to play all 16 games. But if he does, they've got a what should be a significant upgrade over the big V playing left tackle. So now that offensive line should be the best in the league almost regardless of what happens and the best receiving core. That's a great spot to be the quarterback in. Yeah, and you know, again, I keep saying the same thing over and over again. If you are quarterback 11 or 10 or 11 through 20 to 25, your ultimate output will be dependent on your supporting cast more than any more than say Brady, Rogers, Breeze, and the guys at the top. So yeah, Wentz should have a top ten season statistically this year, even if he doesn't play like a top ten quarterback per PFF grades. Yep, that all makes sense. Uh huh. So you're buying, you're giving yourself a little bit of leeway with the quarterback when you have that great of a situation. So it's really an incredible job of team building in Philadelphia in general. Because for the last three or four years, we've said, this is one of the best rosters in the NFL. Yes. And before they won the Super Bowl, we said, well, the only place they're weak is wide receiver and corner. And they fixed it to the, to a point. But I still think as we look to the defensive side of the ball, we'll talk about the pass rush in a minute. But I think their hopes are going to completely rest upon the secondary. Because when they did win the Super Bowl, they did play really well on the back end overall. It really is. I, I think this is probably by a distance the best roster in the NFL yeah. heading into the season. They, the offense looks spectacular start to finish pretty much. The defensive front should again be the best unit in the NFL, which it has been, I think, at least two, maybe three years in a row now. Yep. Um, and then it, it really does all come down to what that secondary does. And there's talent there. The you know Obviously, you get Ronald Darby back. That should be their number one corner. But you've got Sidney Jones starting to emerge now that he's you know a while removed from his significant injury. You've got Crevon LeBlanc, Avante Matt. You've got young guys that have sort of flashed the ability to play well, particularly in uh, limited roles for them. Number two cornerback, I think, is their big kind of question mark. Do they continue to trot out Jalen Mills, even though that's... You're considering Ronald Darby number one. Yes. Right? I'm, cl- I'm considering Ronald Darby number one. I think some combination of Sidney Jones, Crevon LeBlanc, or Avante Maddox will play inside and yep. man the slot. And I think the other, the other spot is the number two corner. And will it be Jalen Mills, who is just average at best? Will it be Rizul Douglas, who has shown flashes, but largely been average at best? Like that's the only spot where they have a question mark. Um, But honestly, to an extent, if so, if you get the slot man down fine, if you get Ronald Darby playing at his best, and that defensive front is as good as it looks like it will be, I can make that's a that's that papers over a lot. That means that that second corner. He really doesn't need to be that good. He just needs to not screw up immediately. Don't be targeted 10 times a game and well, giving up yeah, seven. Don't like, even if you're going to lose, don't lose immediately. Yeah. Like, just, just hold on for a little bit because they're going to get pressure. Like, all you need to do is just not get screwed right off the line. That's essentially how Rasul Douglas has started to play over the right. last couple of years. And we said going into last year, too, losing Patrick Robinson, who is our top slot corner in their Super Bowl year. They lost him going back to New Orleans last year. We said that would be a big drop-off. I mean, yes, that ended up being the case, but also the injuries absolutely torched uh, that secondary last year. So, uh, you know, a lot's going to come down to what they do because as we get to the defensive front, Brandon Graham, do we have that bet again? Yeah. Ten-sack guy, Mm -hmm. Brandon Graham. He'll get ten sacks this year. Malik Jackson's coming in. Fletcher Cox, the best non-Aaron Donald in the league. Maybe (laughs) Derek Barnett lives up to what we thought. He would be. He's been just okay to this point. But even their backups, they're they're, they're just always really deep. Timmy Jernigan's still there. Vinny Curry's still there. Right. They brought back. They brought back Tim Jernigan. They brought back from another place. Vinny Curry. They have got Josh Sweat. Like, Josh Sweat's there. Right. There's some crazy talent on this defensive line. Yeah. Sweat's a, Sweat's one of those guys that we would say. So we went in the fourth round, which is about fine for us as far as the 2018 draft goes, but he was getting first and second round hype based off of his athleticism alone. Right. But he was more of a good run defender in college, not a great pass rusher. So production wasn't there, but he's the type of guy that uh, like a Danell Hunter mm-hmm. could kind of, you know, 
exceed his college production at the NFL level. And, it, and it's not like they're relying on him too. It's just, you know, he's a guy who might be a bonus as your seventh yeah, or eighth pass rusher. exactly. You know, and they like to play seven or eight guys, you know, so he'll be in that mix there as well. And then, you know, linebacker doesn't look great, uh, especially with Jordan Hicks moving on. But, you know, they've played without Jordan Hicks quite a bit due to his uh, injuries over the last couple of years. So linebacker, the weakest spot probably on the defense. But, you know, Zach Brown comes in. He's had some pretty decent years. Uh, but it's not the worst place to be. Right. Weak. Nigel Bradham's a good player. You got TJ Edwards in there. Little, You like Edwards? Little sleeper. Little slow Wisconsin linebacker who's productive. Yeah. So there you go. We like the Eagles. Um, I think we're talking about a Super Bowl Contender. caliber team. Right. We're talking about this team should win this division. They, I think, have the best roster in the NFL. This should be a Super Bowl contending team. Do you buy into any of this? Okay, Carson Wentz hasn't played in a playoff game. Mm-hmm. He there is something to we haven't talked about his health. He hasn't finished each of the last two years because right. of health issues. I believe there are some Eagles fans who aren't just, you know, they don't just have Carson Wentz's back. There was something to Nick Foles had the two highest grades we've seen over the last two years. Come on. And some people were actually thinking, hey, you know, we're better off with Nick Foles. Come on. So no. there's a but but there's a I'm not I'm just painting the uh, argument here. I mean, there's a realistic, you know, Car- if Carson Wentz couldn't play at that Nick Foles level in 2017 during the playoff run, they don't win the playoffs. I mean, Nick Foles sure. carrying them was huge. Yeah, I mean, that, well, that's what happens when you run into the playoffs, right? You're going to need your best players to play well, or you're going to need your quarterback to show up because if you don't, you're running up against the other best teams in the NFL. And if you have an off day, they win. Like, that's kind of how knockout yeah. football in January works. If yeah, your quarterback so I, I shows think Wentz up, is fine. I think Wentz is fine. He's been far more consistent than a Nick Foles, but they got a Super Bowl championship out of the volatile Nick Foles, who at the high end had two 90 plus games, two things we haven't seen Wentz do yet. Yeah, to this I mean, point whatever about the Super Bowl, but like even in the NFC championship game, let's say either Wentz or Foles shows up and is terrible that game. Like that game's going to be like a 9 6 final score. You know what I mean? Both yeah. defenses are just going to throttle the life out of the opposition. So it's not like they had no shot of winning, even if that happened. It's just a completely different game. Instead right. of a blowout against the Vikings, suddenly what they it's, dominated, yeah. Right. Suddenly it's an ugly, low scoring affair where somebody's going to take it by a field goal at the end. Um, obviously, the Super Bowl was a different story. You, you, he needed to be on song then, but that's, again, kind of what happens when you run up against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Right. There isn't an awful lot of margin for error. People, whatever about beating them, you just don't roll into the Super Bowl and blow out the Patriots. That doesn't happen. Well, so you're going to need to play well. And part of the other reason why they won is because, you know, they're they're willing to go for a Philly special on fourth and one at right. the goal line. They're willing to go for it on fourth and five with five minutes left. So they've added, you know, from an analytical standpoint, a couple little advantages from a play calling standpoint over the last couple of years. So when you talk about a good roster, good play callers between the offense and then Jim Schwartz on defense and – some analytical minds in the front office. I mean, it's one of the best well-constructed teams. Sorry, Eagles fans. We're just saying so many nice things about you. So I think it's a Super Bowl caliber team. I yes. think they're certainly the favorites to win the NFC East. I agree. All right, let's wrap it up. Washington Redskins. So it looks like, you know, they're they're in the middle of a rebuild. And it's, it's a tricky spot to be because, you know, we said the Giants are rebuilding. But that's, you know, Pat Shermer. It's his second season. This is Jay Gruden, you know, you know, maybe coaching for his for his life here, coaching for his career, you know, for you know for his job is what I should say. Mm-hmm. With a team that is transitioning to a new quarterback in Dwayne Haskins, we think we assume he'll take the job from Case Keenum sooner rather than later. They've got signs of life on defense and some question marks on the offensive side, especially at left tackle. If Trent Williams is going to get traded, that's huge. Um, this team is yeah, it's there. Similar to the Giants in that they're transitioning, they're, they're restarting, they're rebooting a quarterback. Um, I think they're doing a better job of it so far. Um, I think for a start, they got the better quarterback in the same draft and they did it, what, thir- whatever that is, 13 spots lower down in the draft. Yeah. yeah. So that, and, like, without, and without yeah. having to trade up to do it. So that alone is, makes them winning in terms of, you know, how this transition is going. But you draft a quarterback in the first round. You also get Montez Sweat, a decent pass rusher um, with spectacular athleticism in the first round. Um, you get a guy that I really like, Terry McLaurin, in the third round. 
more to the point, a wide receiver. So you're adding to that pass game. It was one of our rebuild. one of our favorite drafts. They had a, they had high volume of picks, but it was one of our yeah, favorite overall drafts. Really was. So I think they've targeted the right spots early to be able to sort of institute this rebuild. Um, you know, whereas you can question a lot of the moves the Giants have made in terms of why are you targeting the less impactful positions? Yeah. Why are you getting? Why are you acquiring a guard and a strong safety? You know, when everybody else is going with the passing game the redskins have at least gone for the right spots they've gone quarterback wide receiver edge rusher now you can quibble over edge rusher defensive back whatever but they're you know they're hitting the right spots so i think that's huge the offensive line is a huge question mark though because that trent williams thing is monstrous you know he is one of the best left tackles in the game if if you take him off the board and now you're dealing with you know a replacement level player in quotation marks like they've signed Donald Penn, who like Eric Flowers or Jerron Christian, right? They've Donald signed, Penn being there I mean, again, he's he's old. He's in his mid thirties. He is, but he's, he's younger than us, but old. Oh God, don't younger say than that. us, but old. But he's shown significantly better than replacement level play recently, relatively recently. Right. So it's so, nice, nice to have Donald Penn there. Yeah. But when you have, we, we, if we're using creep back toward average again, Trent, just from like a pressure percentage standpoint and a run block grade standpoint. This line probably goes from borderline top 10 to about 20. And that's the without problem, Trent Williams, right? Because of the way everybody else is constructed. Not just that, but a potent, they have a couple of spots now that are potential problem areas. And by that, I don't just mean, you know, they're not optimum. I mean, right. they, are, they have the potential to derail a game right. by being that problem spot. Yeah. And uh, if Donald Penn gets back to the way he was, you know, prior to last year when they moved him to right tackle in Oakland, then maybe it's okay. And maybe they do get something for Trent Williams and it ends up being good for the future in Washington. So O-line on paper with Trent Williams or with uh, bounce back Donald Penn looks reasonable. I, I think trying to figure out what they have from a playmaker standpoint on paper, it's not great. Um, even though you like McLaurin, we haven't seen it from him yet. Trey Quinn, though, he's done some nice things in the slot. It sounds like he's going to be the guy there. Uh, SMU guy that uh, graded really well for us. Uh, seventh round pick in 2018. It looks like he's going to get some love there. Josh Doxson has not emerged the way we had hoped coming right. out of the 2016 draft. So a lot of questions at the wide receiver position there. And then just aging slash banged up tight ends. Jordan Reed and Vernon Davis. You know, what do they still have left? You know, reading their names looks nice as far as a two tight end set goes. But Vernon Davis... Uh, really getting old, and Jordan Reed has you know been banged up quite a bit over the last couple of years. And then they're just loaded in the backfield with Adrian Peterson and Darius Geis, Chris Thompson, and just all sorts of bodies back there. Bryce Love, too. Bryce Love, yeah. That's kind of interesting one. Um, they're I, building a backfield that would be great around, say, Lamar Jackson. Yes. The Adrian Peterson thing is fascinating because he was really quite decent last year. And apparently, given what's happened, he, he kind of needs the money. So he, right. he needs to keep being good. So they keep paying him money after. How old is he at this point? Like deep into his thirties. So uh, still younger than you. Shh, stop. Stop articulating how he's between older. thirty and thirty-seven. Okay, I know that. Yeah. Well, that makes him by definition younger than me. Then he's younger yeah. than you. Yeah. But old, maybe for the NFL. Yes. And then the, on the defensive side, the defensive front has emerged as one of the you know best in the NFL. It really is. Jonathan Allen. We thought again he would be uh, the best, if you know, one of the best defensive players in that 2017 draft. He's shown flashes of that. Deron Payne, another first round pick out of Bama in 2018. Montez Sweat, who you mentioned, and Matt Ioannidis. Yes, your guy, fifth Matt. round pick. Uh, one of the most, one of the highest pressure percentages among all interior defensive linemen over the last two seasons yes he did for ionitis that's a really also don't forget ryan kerrigan like that's a really strong defense front i haven't even mentioned ryan kerrigan right. who is just quietly we keep forgetting i apologize to redskins fans because renner and i did a video on the best on the 2011 draft class and how great they ryan are kerrigan. yeah i yeah. mean we're talking jj watt and von miller right. and patrick peterson all these guys that came out that year yeah and just this quietly consistent 50 to 70 pressure guy every year yeah. ryan kerrigan we overlooked him right yeah but he's still very very good bobby uh bobby Sloak taught him how to rush the passer him yeah. and, and arakpo yeah back in the day i think he may have helped him a little bit well we'll give him credit for it anyway so yeah that front seven looks pretty good 
Uh, you know, so I think similar to the Eagles, a lot of their season is going to depend on the secondary. Yeah. Josh Norman back there, Fabian Moreau, Greg Stroman, all guys who have done it at one point, but have been very inconsistent. Yeah. So we bring in Landon Collins. That should make a nice, healthy impact, albeit, you know, in a fairly defined role. Like he's not going to want to see how they use him. Yeah. I mean, I want to see if they use him in that true strong safety role. If, if, if it's more split field coverages where he's still fine there, you know, the usage pattern will be important for Collins. I think seeing what kind of Josh Norman we get is going to be interesting, whether he's sort of on the decline or whether we just had a rough couple of rough patch yeah. and he's still got the talent to be a, a, an impact corner. The guy that I'd be, I, I'm kind of quietly excited for is Greg Strawman. I think he's got some real skills in that secondary, but obviously, you know, a seventh round pick that didn't play that much. It's, it's yeah. not exactly a sure thing, but I, I would have quiet hopes for him succeeding. And Renner loved Jimmy Moreland this year's seventh round pick. Yeah. Feisty slot out of uh, James Madison. But, uh, you know, when Norman signed his contract, we said, you know, that tail end of the contract is when we're going to see he'll be, you know, we keep saying old, but old for a cornerback. We haven't seen too many cornerbacks, non Terrence Newman additions that have, uh, you know, really succeeded into their 30s. So we'll see what happens with Norman. And even if you look at the contract, it's not like he has been exceptional over these last couple of years with Washington. So... Where do you see this team? Just to go, We should discuss Dwayne Haskins a little bit okay. on the offensive side of the ball. He was that guy that didn't – we didn't love him as a top 10 pick, but it's like, all right, I, I see him as a first-round quarterback. He they got do, him exactly where he should have gone. Yeah, I'm good. Which is weird because that yeah. very rarely happens for first-round quarterbacks. Yeah, I don't, I don't think – you know, we looked at Kyler Murray and said he's got top 10 NFL quarterback potential, and if that's the case, he, I mean, everybody has that, but we thought he had more potential for that. That's a number one overall pick. Haskins has a chance to be in that middle tier where if you do put everything around him, you'll see success. I mean, that's exactly exactly what you saw at Ohio State. He threw 50 touchdowns last year with an exceptional group of wide receivers in a good situation and creating a ton of yards after the catch and all this stuff. So I think he's capable of doing that. I didn't love his play under pressure. As unstable as that is, it was more just the way he handled it and the way he handled road games and stuff like that. But it was still only his first year as a starter for whatever that's worth. I also don't think that means everybody just gets better. Right. But, um, you know, all these different factors going in. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing Haskins, even though I don't think his offensive situation is it's probably a bottom third of the NFL situation right now. But they have to they have to do everything they can to improve that over the next couple of years. Yeah. The pressure thing is concerning because of what we talked about in terms of losing Trent Williams, potentially. And if he's right. not there and that offensive right. line goes down to being a bottom third unit and suddenly you've got a rookie who has shown not who's shown to be uncomfortable under pressure, um, struggling with potentially a lot more pressure than you want. Yeah, and I thought there were some similarities between him and Josh Rosen coming out. And then to repeat the th- top three quarterbacks coming out the last two years, by our grades, Baker by far, Kyler well, behind him. Then Darnold, because he, and, and I think mostly because he could bridge the gap outside of structure. And then the rest of the guys um, are either just too inaccurate from a clean pocket or just um, or like a Haskins or a Rosen. They're pretty good in a clean pocket. And when everything's good, they make NFL looking throws, but not enough outside of structure. I think that's where Haskins is. So we'll see if he can improve upon that. We sh- he showed signs of life down the stretch last year, too, particularly. Northwestern in the Big Ten championship game. Yeah, I mean, I think... Like I say, I think they, they've gone about a rebuild in the correct way. They got really – I think they got lucky in the draft. Like they, 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 had, they had the guts to hold their nerve and not do anything crazy when it came to quarterbacks. And they just so happened, I think, to get the one they wanted fall all the way to them. So for them, yeah. it worked perfectly. But, that, I mean, it worked perfectly so you can kind of give them credit for that. But I still think it was kind of lucky that he ended up slipping that way and falling into their laps. You think, Uh, but that's a good thing. Five to eight wins for this team. Yeah, just because it's not the easiest division in the world. I think this is one of those five to eight win teams that's better than that. Do you know what I mean? Like they, so this could be like an eight and eight caliber team that wins five games because they have to go against the Eagles and the Cowboys twice a year, Um, and they may end up getting swept in both of those. But I think this will be a decent team. Certainly better team than the Giants are in the division. Tricky position for Jay Gruden because, yeah, it looks like a bit of a rebuild. Yeah. But, of course, at this point in his tenure, he's going to want 
you know, a playoff run. So it yeah. would take a uh, best case scenario would be Haskins exceeds expectations. Mm -hmm. The O line stays intact. Uh, playmakers emerge and that front seven, I think dominant, you know, becomes yeah. a dominant type unit, which they have the potential to do. Yeah. So it's all in there. So that's it, man. NFC East. Nice. Done. Right from Chris's office. This is comfy. I could get, I could get used to this. I mean, <laughs> yours is fine, but I'm, I've You're got really comfort. comfy. Right. You've got the really comfy I got a chair. footstool. I got my feet up. I got relaxation going. It's a bit of a deep, you know, an incline going here. I like this. Maybe there's another chair. Maybe I'll just use that chair. Yeah, we get both of them here. I could do that. I'll mm. still be taller than you, so it'll be fine. Oh, of course. So we got to make sure we put the furniture back before he sees it and all Can you stuff. imagine what your feet would look like on the desk in perspective terms, like from the camera? Can only imagine. It'd be amazing. Like three foot wide. Yeah. We should do that next time. Yeah. See what we can do. Mm -hmm. So that'll do it. There's your bonus podcast. It's not even a bonus anymore. No, We're going to two per week. Regularly scheduled program. Regularly scheduled two per week. Um, the the feedback was just very heavy. It was NFC East. That's what everybody said. Yeah. So give us feedback. Who do you want us to cover next? Next. It, we're a podcast of the people. So whichever podcast or whichever division you guys suggest, we'll do it. Yep. All right. So NFC East is in the books. We've got seven more to get through. We'll be back Monday. We'll do a little bit more news and roundup, and then we'll hit up one more division. Or do we just do divisions from now on? Uh, no, yeah, next I mean, give a little bit of news if anything's happened. Over news and roundup, yeah, plus division, right? Might be a two-hour pod. We just we're Oof. long winded. We just yeah. keep going. Now we got to get the hell out of the building before we get trapped here because Trump's flying in for a rally. Yeah, we got to go uh, beat the traffic. All right, thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you guys again on Monday. Thanks, Chris.